What's up guys, it's Larry. Welcome back to Critical Care Connection. Today we're gonna to be talking about aortic aneurysms. And I've got my little buddy Maverick here. Come here Maverick, you wanna say hello? Come here, come here, say hey. There, there's our classroom buddy right there. This is Maverick, he's our newest addition. He's about 16 weeks old and he's anxious to start teaching too, evidently, because he's just wandering around here. So unless you're going to teach them, get back down there. So today we're going to be talking about aneurysms and we're going to be talking about how we get them, what do we do to fix them, and we're going to learn lots of stuff. So stay tuned, let's get into it. So let's take a quick look at this diagram of the heart so we can greater appreciate exactly where the aorta is and where it comes from. I know a lot of people know the term, but could you tell me how it functions and where it comes from? So let's just do a quick picture of all the things that lead up to the aorta. So on your heart here, remember this is going to be backwards. So what's left here is going to be right and what's right here is going to be left because normally this guy would be turned around sitting like this facing this direction. So what we have here, flow in, you've got superior vena cava here. This is going to drop down into, so let's break this open here. So that's going to bump right down into your right atrium here. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to go through a tricuspid valve that's going to go into the bottom of your right ventricle. So from there, what's going to happen is blood's going to be pumped out of there. If you look up in there, there's another valve. This one is called the pulmonic valve. Why? Because it's going to the pulmonary arteries. So what you're going to see here is it's going to come up. You can see this one split here this direction, but in reality, if you look around the back, you can see where it splits off and then it's gonna go into the lungs there. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna go through your lungs and then the blood's gonna come back into the heart here. So it's gonna come via pulmonary veins because remember arteries feed oxygenated rich blood to something and veins return it. So what's going to happen here is that's going to be returned into your left atrium. And then what you've got is another valve here, which is kind of backwards to see here. But so this is going to be your mitral valve. And then you're going to feed into what? Your left ventricle. So this is kind of your last resting place for everything from the heart. Now it's going to send it to the body and it's going to send it via the aorta. This is the meat and potatoes of what we're talking about today. So after it leaves that LV, if you peek up in there, you can see that number 40 right there. That is going to be the last set of valves that's got to go through. So that's appropriately named your aortic valve. So once it goes through your aortic valve, now it's going to throw it straight up through here. And then now what we're going to do is we're going to draw on a little bit further a pass of what the aorta actually looks like as it goes down. All right, let's take a quick peek at the aorta. We know it comes from the heart and how it comes through the heart. So let's look at what it looks like otherwise. So it's gonna be a very basic drawing from here because there's a lot of things that come off of this. Up top, you've got subclavian arteries that go to your arms and then carotid arteries feed off of there too. Downstream, you've got the kidneys and you've got your both renal arteries and notice how it branches at the bottom and those are gonna be your common iliacs. All right, so let's look at the sections of the aorta and how we're gonna call them by name. So at the top, you're gonna to have your thoracic aorta, and then at the other side of that, your arch is gonna be your aortic arch, and then it's gonna bring down into the descending thoracic aorta, which means going downward. Now we're gonna draw a line here between the difference of the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity, because below it, now we're gonna have your abdominal aorta here. And then if we go even further, this is where we're gonna branch off into common iliac arteries. And then even if, if you go further below that, you're gonna have an internal and an external iliac. All right, so if we were to take a microscope and look at the vessel walls themselves, you're gonna notice there's three layers of walls on both sides, blood in the middle, so these layers, the inner layer is called the intima, and then you have the middle layer is called the media, and then your outer layer is called your adventitia. So 
All right, let's do a little example here. So we're gonna draw a tear in the inner liner of the vessel, so right on the intima. So this is called a dissection. This is when you have a tear on the wall. So what's gonna happen from that point forward is blood that's flowing past, well, it's gonna scurry right on in that little hole and it's gonna collect in there in a pocket. And over time, pressure, other factors, it's gonna cause that to kind of push deeper and deeper and probably gonna be wider as well. So when the blood collects inside the dissection like this, it creates a kind of a false space for blood to sit. So what we'll do is we're gonna call this a false lumen where it sits in between the walls like this. And this is the beginnings of a lot of problems down the road for people that have these. So let's look at what happens over time with a vessel wall. So eventually you got the tear, now you start to have this bulge where it's weaker. It's not as strong when you only got two out of the three vessel walls. So it starts to push out on the weak spot. So time and time passes. Now we've got increased pressure and a bigger tear. So, well, it gets bigger. And then consequently after a long time, it's gonna rupture eventually. And if it does rupture, this is a life-threatening emergency and requires immediate surgery. All right, so potentially it could be pretty bad here. But why does this happen? So potential causes high blood pressure that puts increased pressure on the vessel walls. Genetics, if you have a family history of these things, it's good to get checked out. So congenital syndromes such as Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos syndromes, those are connective tissue disorders, so that puts you at increased risk. Aortitis or inflammation of the aorta. Um, trauma, smoking and age both decrease the elasticity of uh, certain tissues in your body. So this puts you, of course, a higher risk of having something like that tear in a vessel wall. All right, so we know what causes it, but how the heck do we prove that that's what's going on? So CT scans, MRIs, both high resolution imaging that can show us. Echoes and TEEs are really good for upper like thoracics and aortic arches but not so much for abdominals because they're only looking up top x-ray and you'll have to excuse me arteriogram kind of went off the screen there but that's where they're going to inject the dye and they can see where something's bulged so what do we do to fix it per se so it's pretty straightforward if they're small enough you're going to keep a close eye on it stay in touch with your vascular team and just do regular monitored checkups and then control the things that make them worse, such as blood pressure. After that, if you need it repaired, surgery. So there's open abdominal or abdomen chest, and then there's gonna be endovascular repair as well. Endovascular repair is gonna be a much simpler, more straightforward procedure. That's where they're gonna go in through your groins and then they're gonna put in a graft. So much shorter repair time, much shorter recovery time. All in all, that's why it pays to stay on top of your game. So I wanted to touch back on the size. So when is big above average? So let's talk about when do you have surgery? Usually in women, it's five centimeters and above, five and a half centimeters for men. This goes for abdominal and upper thoracic um, three to four centimeters on your iliacs because they're a lot smaller caliber vessels. Now this doesn't mean that if you're continuing to have pain that's not resolved and they don't have an answer for why, that you shouldn't have surgery before then as well. All right, let's take a quick peek at a cool animation of an endovascular repair. Look at there. You see there is the aneurysm and that is the graft being fed in through the right common iliac there so once they get that in place they go ahead and inflate the top of the graft so it's metal cage to hold in place and stand up stronger they insert a wire through the left iliac there up into the stent itself so what they're going to do is once it's in place they position it a couple of times to make sure it's in the right spot look there those two arteries right above that stent, those are your renal arteries. You don't want to cover those, you wouldn't pee ever again. So once it's in place, right below there, they extend it out. 
to kind of solidify its placement there. Step two is they go ahead and inflate the rest of the graph down below it. Then they place a balloon to go ahead and stretch that graph out so it holds in place really strong. And then the last piece to that is they're gonna go ahead and deploy the end of the graph for the left side. Hey guys, thanks for coming out and hanging out with me today. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something and I hope it's something that you'll keep with you in your practice. Um, if you have any questions or thoughts, please reach out to me. I'll be glad to answer them in any way. Otherwise, until next time, I'll see you guys. Be safe. Strong work.